Welcome to the third day of the RISE Annual Conference 2021, our final day. Um, I'm going to hand straight over to Nick Spall, who is chairing our first session today, session six of the conference on COVID learning loss. So Nick, the floor is yours. Great, thanks Dave. Um, and welcome, morning everyone um, in DC and afternoon to people joining us from Abuja and Oxford. Uh, today's session is going to be, or well, the morning session is going to be on COVID learning losses. Um, I think everyone can recognize that this is the largest educational shock that's happened globally uh, since World War II. Uh, nearly a billion children and youth have been out of school. Uh, and for many children, that's an ongoing situation with learning losses growing and continuing over time. Uh, today, we're going to hear from three presentations. Uh, the first one is going to be from Gabrielle Wills, who's going to give us uh, an overview of the extent of learning losses in South Africa. After that, we're going to move to Botswana with Motsepi Matseng, who's going to give us um, an indication of a low-tech intervention to mitigate against the learning losses from COVID. Uh, this is in Botswana. And then lastly, we're going to turn to Abu Siddiqui, um, who's going to give us insight on an intervention in Bangladesh, um, a randomized experiment of telementoring and homeschooling during the COVID-19 epidemic. So the first presentation that we're going to hear from is from Gabrielle Wills, uh, who's presenting um, a paper uh, that she has co-authored uh, together with um, a colleague from the Department of Basic Education, as well as Kelly Ardington. Uh, this has been a particularly influential paper in South Africa. It's been cited in Parliament. It's been quoted by the minister. It's made the front page of many of the newspapers. Uh, and I think it's set the COVID learning loss agenda in South Africa front and center of the national discourse. Um, so I'm going to hand straight over to um, Gabrielle Wills. But just a reminder to everyone that if you do have Q&A, uh, if you've got questions to use the Q&A function that's at the bottom of Zoom, uh, just next to the raise hand feature, not the comment section. Um, and you can do that as people are speaking or afterwards. And if you want to ask a question, just click the raise hand function in Zoom and we'll get to you. Uh, so Gabby, uh, over to you. You've got 15 minutes. I'd have encouraged everyone to please time themselves. I said to them, we're all adults. Uh, we can all use our cell phones and time ourselves. We don't need to pretend that we're at a race course uh, and race through our slides to try and get through to it. So Gabby, over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today um, and to present to you on this uh, public holiday in South Africa Heritage Day, which we're celebrating. Um, but I'm just I'm pleased to present this work on COVID learning losses and particularly looking at early grade reading in South Africa. And I just want to acknowledge my co-authors, Kelly Arlington and Jan Likotze on this piece. I'm not able to move forward. I'm not sure why. There we are. Um, so, as we know, developing countries were facing a learning crisis prior to the pandemic, and the pandemic is expected to exacerbate this crisis and particularly to widen existing inequalities in learning. Children from poorer countries have been missing more classroom instruction time than in children from high income countries. There's some evidence on this. And it, Adding to this is that poorer nations have generally been less well equipped to support remote learning. But what we found is that there's, there is trade offs between the need for these health interventions, as well as the need to consider what is what this means for children's development. And really, we need to put, put, be able to be put evidence on the table so that governments can really hold these things in balance, and particularly to understand what really are the costs of these uh, school closures. In this particular paper, we provide empirical evidence of short run COVID-19 uh, disruptions on learning in a developing country context of South Africa. And we use data collected pre and post COVID-19 related school closures. And particularly we draw on three longitudinal studies of early grade reading in Anguni language, home languages and in English um, in no fee schools in three of our nine South African provinces. And for the estimation, we employed a difference in difference strategy. We use this to estimate the short-term learning losses and particularly in reading for grade two and four students from under-resourced schools. The headline finding of all of this is that children um, lost a 60, I'll just go back, they lost 60% of school days in 2020 relative to 2019. 
Um, and what this translates to for the grade two sample is that children lost about 57 to 70% of a year of learning. In grade four in Mpumalanga province, this was about 62% to 81% of a year of learning. And this really implies learning loss to school loss ratios of about one to 1.4. What about the empirical literature on learning losses? Most of the, what has been published um, on, on actual learning losses in the short term has come mainly from high income countries where school closures were fairly short and schooling systems are effective. And really this evidence has provided a best case scenario um, of what these COVID impacts would have been. Um, but there is also some very useful emerging evidence that's coming from developing countries and um, mostly however from unpublished work and often drawing from select samples because of the diff difficulty of the nature of collecting data on, on, on assessment data during the COVID period. What about, however, there was a lot of uh, very good uh, evidence that was produced on, to model COVID-19 learning losses. Um, and these studies looked at the impacts of planned and unplanned school closures um, from historical events and then applied this to pre-pandemic data to model and predict the likely impact of COVID-19 school closures on learning in the short and the long term. And I think what's useful from this, this work in particular is that it, it attributes learning losses to two parts, the opportunity cost of lost learning, which reflects a loss relative to what a child would learn over a typical year. But then there's also this deterioration component where knowledge is forgotten over time. And in the context of South Africa, um, Martin Gustafson and Carol Nubel-Deliwa, they used information on historical disruptions and they assumed learning losses that we would have experienced relative to school days, that this ratio would be about 1.25 in South Africa. And we actually, our results are not far off that. But what about our data? So the data we use for this, and um, we, we think about a COVID group and we think about a counterfactual for the grade two um, assessment. Um, and this estimation, we, we draw on the Funda One Day uh, data from the Eastern Cape. These children were in grade two in 2020, and they were assessed um, at the end of grade one in 2019, and then at the beginning of grade three in 2021. And then they are compared to a counterfactual group of grade twos in 2019, who were assessed at the beginning of grade two in 2019, and then at the end of grade two in 2019. And for the grade four sample, however, um, here we, we draw on the early grade reading study, the second um, EGRA study, and these grade fours were, were, in 20, were in grade four in 2020, and uh, you can see at the points at which they were assessed, and then similarly for the, uh, the story powered schools, um, from which we draw our counterfactual, these children were in grade four in 2019, and you can see the terms and, and grades at which they were assessed for us to be able to uh, identify gains in learning. In terms of the sample characteristics, our COVID group and our counterfactual group are very similar with respect to baseline household characteristics, as well as the poverty level of the school, which we call school quintile one, two, and three. Um, however, there's uh, one area where there was a significant difference between our COVID group and our counterfactual group for grade, two, grade twos, and that's specifically with relation to attrition, which would be a combination of dropout and absenteeism on the day of the survey. But I also just want to point out that computer access for these children is very limited. Um, internet access would even be lower than this and access to remote learning opportunities would even be lower than this estimate. For our method, we employ a difference in difference strategy and um, really we estimate this in a very typical form, but in a first difference form. So we are, our outcome measure is a learning gain. And we divide this gain by the number of days between the first and the second assessments to account for the differential time periods that, that occur between these assessments. And then we scale that um, to one year. But do we believe that these counterfactuals are good counterfactuals? Well, in the case of the grade two, our, our COVID co cohort and our counterfactual are drawn from the same schools and we're able to apply school fixed to fix. Um, yes, there's this differential attrition problem, but um, even, even with this, uh, the samples are balanced on their household possessions. And if anything, the COVID effect is likely to be biased downwards as attrition is higher for students with lower baseline reading proficiency. For the grade four estimation, um, our EGRS COVID group is fairly similar um, to the story part sessions, uh, story part schools counterfactual group on ha baseline household characteristics. And then additionally, we applied um, course and exact matching to minimize the potential selection bias. 
Just very quickly, there is evidence of parallel trends in prior performance. I've circled um, the, the trajectory that would have occurred during the COVID-19 period, but for the rest of the time, um, pre-pandemic, there really is significant evidence in our data to suggest that there is evidence of parallel trends um, for these COVID and counterfactual groups. But quickly, what happened in schools in 2020 in South Africa? So schools may close for an official number of days, um, which are mandated by the state. But uh, in addition to that, schools may close because of um, being simply choosing not to be present. Um, or closing early or opening clo uh, or, or closing early. But there's also this issue of rotational timetabling. So um, it, what happened in the majority of schools in South Africa is that children attended every alternate day or perhaps one week on and one week off. And when we take this into account, um, our grade two sample only received 40% of the number of instructional days that they would have received in 2020. And for the grade four sample, this is very similar. Moving on to our main result. Um, this shows you uh, the main uh, difference in difference estimation result. What we can see is with respect to correct letters sounded per minute, um, children were reading 16 minutes, 16 letters sounds per minute less in 2020 relative to 20, uh, 2019. And relative to the counterfactual group, which is reflected by the constant term, this reflects about 70% of a year of learning. For grade two home language reading, grade four home language reading, and grade four English reading, children um, in the COVID period were reading about seven words correct per minute less uh, in the 2020 period. And relative to the counterfactual group, this is about 57% to 81% for these different groups. So really the impact has been very significant relative to what children would normally have learned. But what about heterogeneous impacts? So to what, to what extent do we think that the pandemic impacts on children differentially depending on their baseline initial reading scores? Um, and then we also look at gender. Well, it's actually not clear how this would pan out because children who, um, who are weaker might, might have less opportunity to learn at school. They're less prepared to, to learn at home, I mean. But children who are, are stronger initially might also be, have been benefiting more from being at school. So the direction of the impact is not quite clear. What do we find? With letter sound reading, it's quite interesting. Letter sound reading is a constrained skill. And generally in South Africa, children, there's a diminishing improvement in letter sound reading from about 20 letters. Um, so initially, um, we find that, that children that are in the highest proficiency tercile at baseline, they actually gain less. Um, but when it comes to looking at the impacts relative to children that were performing uh, worse at, ba at baseline, um, there seems to be some kind of protective effect um, for children who are who are stronger um, over the COVID period. However, Five minutes. We, find, we find something quite different for um, reading of, of, of words and, and text. In this case, for the grade fours, we find that children who were in the second tercile or third tercile, so in other words, better performing, they appear to be doing, um, appear to be more negatively impacted um, through the COVID um, event than children who are weaker. What about gender? In South Africa, girls typically do better than boys and particularly in reading. And you can see the positive coefficient on the female, um, on the female coefficient. But what about the interaction term? Um, there's quite clear evidence that girls over the, through the, the COVID-19 pandemic were more negatively impacted as a result of the COVID pandemic. And in grade four, what this reflects in percentage terms is that they were, their learning losses were about 20 27% um, higher for girls than it was for boys. So really in conclusion, in, in the summary, we found that early grade students lost between 57% to 81% of a year of learning when measured by reading outcomes. And then obviously we found some evidence, but specifically from the grade four sample and more so there, that the reading trajectories of children benefiting more from school pre-pandemic, so namely, namely girls and children with stronger proficiencies are more negatively impacted. And it's important to note that these were COVID impacts for 2020. These short-term deficits will most certainly continue into, into 2021, 
rotational timetabling um, was applied in almost in the majority of schools for the first half of this year. Um, and and um, what this meant is that schools really were effectively still closed every second day um, for children. Um, officially, this has changed from the middle of the year and you know, been able to put evidence on the table around learning losses. And then as well as this max, mass teacher vaccination program, program that occurred really played an important role in, in this decision to, to ensure that children return daily. But in reality, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of anecdotal evidence and actual real evidence coming out that, that this is still happening um, in some schools um, due to a one week to social distancing requirement, this rotational scheduling is still being applied. Um, it's unclear whether these gaps will remain static, grow or narrow over time. We would probably say they're going to grow because it really depends on the ability of the system to remediate losses. Um, and there's a lot of evidence um, and very good work that has shown that if children return to school and, and ped pedagogy continues as usual in line with curriculum demands, we're going to see that children are just not going to be able to keep up um, with the curriculum. They'll fall further and further behind. In South Africa, we have um, the Department of Basic Education has published a series of recovery annual teaching plans to recover learning losses over a three-year period. But really, in, 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 in reality, it's unlikely that meaningful remedial programs are actually in place. And this is not because people don't want to do this, but because it's actually very hard to do. And we've seen this in so many studies that have been presented um, over the years at RISE, um, that, it's, that it can be a real challenge to implement um, effective remedial programs in these contexts. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much, Gabby, and thanks for sticking to time. Um, I think that that's a really important paper and her emphasis on that these are 2020 learning losses and not 2021 learning losses. If we extrapolate those findings, which some other South African research has done, it kind of suggests that it's an entire year of learning that the average child in South Africa has lost. So the average 11 year old knows in 2021 what the average 10 year old knew in 2019. So these are really quite severe losses. Um, thanks for that, Gabby. We're next going to turn to Motsepi Macheng from uh, Botswana, who's going to present on a low-tech um, remedial or catch-up intervention in Botswana. Motsepi, over to you. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, I'm really excited to be presenting uh, our paper today uh, with colleagues Noam Engress from the University of Oxford and Young Love, as well as Peter Bergman uh, from the University of Columbia. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, this is one um, of the very first experimental evidence on limiting learning losses uh, using low tech in a pandemic. Uh, so we'll share more on the context of Botswana, uh, but also just some key results as well as policy implications on how this work can be carried going forward. So the slide here um, is us in the field uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as Young Love Organization, we're one of the largest youth serving organizations in the country. Uh, we work closely with government to ensure that each and every one of our programming um, is in primary and junior secondary school. Our mission is to translate rigorous research into high impact uh, health and education programming that will be very much relevant for young people. Prior to COVID-19, uh, we were very much active in schools implementing uh, the teaching at the right level approach, uh, which focuses on grouping students according to their different learning abilities rather than by age or grade and working very much to target uh, material uh, depending on where the student is at. So meeting the student uh, where they're at. Uh, we had reached over 15 to 20 uh, percent of primary schools in the country and working closely with a coalition of partners. Uh, just to share the context of, of Botswana, uh, but also more broadly, uh, is that even before the pandemic, uh, there was a learning crisis. Uh, we conducted a situational analysis uh, to all grade five students in the country. And we find that only 10% uh, can do division. So that means that majority of the students that are in schools uh, are not actually learning or falling behind. Uh, we also then collected phone numbers uh, from the schools that we worked with. 
uh, you know, prior to schools shutting down, uh, this was in early March. Um, we also realized that from the numbers that we collected, over 80% of numbers were not enrolled uh, in prior programming before. So that means that they hadn't received uh, the teaching at the right level program before. And one of our big emphasis was that we wanted to uh, we wanted to see and generate evidence on actually what works. Uh, we ran rapid trials in monthly cycles uh, to balance generation of evidence amidst uncertainty while delivering services. We also found uh, that as we went further into the regions, there was low internet access throughout the country. And hence why the motivation of the interventions that we uh, implemented during the times when schools were closed, uh, we believe that this body of work uh, has direct implications for government, as well as other NGOs who wish to replicate some of this work uh, in the country. Uh, just to iterate uh, this point again uh, of why this work was necessary, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic really heightened um, students being out of school and therefore the motivation of of why we should continue um, providing remote learning services. And what we did during this time or how we provided uh, remote services is using low tech. Uh, and what we call by low tech is just a simple mobile phone uh, that has no uh, access to internet uh, or deemed as a smartphone, just a simple phone uh, that can call and send text messages. When you look at the graph here, it shows that in low uh, to lower middle income countries, uh, below 40% have access to internet. Uh, but when you look um, again to this graph and also contextualize it to the Botswana context, um, there is access to just a simple mobile phone with over 120% of all households in the country. So low tech was a very much uh, big motivation as to uh, how we could deliver remote services because it ensured high access, but also this can be done at a low cost. As I've mentioned, uh, from the phone numbers uh, that we collected, we called each and every parent uh, in, in that sample to be able to say, uh, this is what we're going to be delivering. Uh, would, you, would, would you like to consent uh, to being part of the program? Uh, we ran a rapid trial uh, with over 4,550 households in Botswana uh, who were enrolled in the distance learning program. Uh, but also, again, when you see the map here, this is the map of Botswana you see that it is very much widespread, um, or rather the households are widespread to both rural as well as urban areas in the country, ensuring that we are really reaching majority uh, of students and parents in the country. Uh, this also shows that uh, we reached nine out of 10 regions in the country, so very much uh, a widespread uh, study. Uh, we also had two interventions that we'll also share key results based mainly on. Uh, the first intervention was SMS only, uh, delivering simple SMSs per week uh, to the parents' phone uh, for them to also show their student uh, what the messages were that conduct that contained education material. Uh, we also, our second intervention included 20 minute instructional phone calls, uh, as well as SMSs to children and caregivers. So these uh, phone calls were mainly to support students to say, uh, did you receive the SMS content, but also do you need any additional uh, support? Um, but also prior to starting the work that we did, uh, we conducted a phone-based assessment using an ACER tool, which has largely used over 14 countries. Uh, this is a simple diagnostic tool to be able to see uh, where the student's ability is at so that when we send uh, the material, we actually know what the child knows. So if the student, uh, according to this diagnostic tool, uh, understood um, addition, uh, we'll be able to now move to the next stage and send them uh, subtraction material. So just again, tailoring the material according to where the student is at. So just some key results uh, here, uh, particularly on, on learning. Uh, once, as I've mentioned, we, we had two main interventions. Uh, the results here uh, show statistically significant differences between treatment and control groups. Uh, we find on the SMS only, uh, there was no significant um, effects on average, uh, particularly for SMS only. 
Uh, however, for the combined intervention, uh, we find that there was huge, um, you know, significant results here uh, of one of 0.12 standard deviations, uh, particularly in ensuring that there are some learning gains. Uh, but also when you see on the slide is that targeted uh, messaging very much, you know, boosted learning gains, and it actually generally worked much better than when the material uh, was not targeted. The second key results uh, that I would like to share here is just on parents' investment and beliefs. Uh, we found that for the SMS only intervention, our students learned a little, uh, but there were marginal effects uh, on parents, you know, uh, believing that they can identify the child's level, uh, they feel confident to support. Um, you know, the child on, on learning and ensuring that uh, they progress. Uh, but when you look at also at the SMS um, and as well as the phone interventions, you find that there were significant learning gains. And this also related more on, on significant, um, you know, understanding of parental investment and beliefs. Uh, and therefore this, you know, could relate because the parents as well as the students, uh, they were receiving the same material. They were much more invested. Parents now knew uh, the level that the child was at. And then you could say that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, direct uh, connection between the parents and students um, you know, you could suggest that it indeed uh, ensure that parents actually know uh, what their child actually knows. So these are some of uh, the two main results we'll present today. Um, now, moving into conclusion uh, and was, as well as policy implications on how can we expand this work further, is that this presents some of the first uh, and only RCT evidence uh, so far on, on curbing learning loss during COVID-19 uh, with short and long-term implications. Uh, we find that this is also a highly cost-effective uh, intervention uh, with returns of why one year of schooling per 100 USD dollars. Uh, we also find that often at times, uh, there are large government ICT budgets that can often be better spent. Uh, so instead of going for the flashy, uh, as well as high um, you know, technology devices, uh, let us see how we can be able to teach students uh, in a way such that uh, it enables high access. Uh, we also find that targeted instruction uh, via phone can be done cheaply and is uh, potentially a scalable delivery model. Um, but also imagine, for example, if we're only targeting uh, the least performing students in a class, uh, we're able to ensure that we can boost our learning gains, particularly with the phone, uh, as well as the SMS uh, intervention. Uh, we also find that That's this has been relatively low cost, uh, as well as uh, ensuring that this is particularly important in low and middle uh, income countries. Uh, as also mentioned, this can be used uh, when schools are closed, but this is not the first time that this will happen. They are uh, natural disasters, teacher strikes where schools are closed, and therefore this could be uh, an intervention complementing normal schooling. Uh, again, uh, this also emphasized parental engagement is very key uh, to learning. Uh, this is just a timeline of how we, we worked. Uh, we ran trials for four months in Botswana, but then this has now taken off uh, in more countries. Um, as, you, as you could see here, this is where it is happening. Uh, it, is, it is replicated in Kenya, uh, in India, uh, and as well as in Nepal and, and trials uh, are also going to be starting in Uganda as well as in Philippines. Uh, the last slide just shares more of the implementation uh, and research partners that we and funding partners that came on board uh, to support some of this work. That said, we'd just like to say thank you all. I'm happy to field any questions and any comments um, and really interested to hear from the attendees that are here today. Thank you. Great, thanks, Motepi. Um, I think two things stick out for me there. The one is that you guys were really quick to get all of those phone numbers before all the kids left school. Uh, so that's a, obviously a big plus. But the second one is also the role of mobile phones uh, going forward and that we've sort of had a big uh, injection in the bum, as it were, uh, for from this COVID-19 pandemic about what's possible with phones, both as far as interventions, what you've just been speaking about here, but also if we think about um, Abhijit and Mauricio's paper the other day about doing phone-based assessments uh, as opposed to the traditional paper-based EGRAs. 
Um, okay, so our last presentation is going to be um, Abu Siddiqui uh, from the Technical University of Munich, uh, although he's also just moved on his way to King's College in London. Uh, so Abu, over to you. Uh, you've got 15 minutes. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, let me try my slides. Yes, uh, hi, I'm Abu and I'm presenting a joint work with three colleagues of mine from Monash University, uh, Hasibul Hassan, Asad Islam and Lian Chunwen. Asad is actually in the audience today, so if you have any uh, quick questions, he would be able to answer it in the chat. And today my talk is about an educational intervention we did in rural Bangladesh in the middle of this pandemic. And this is part of a larger project we are currently doing with the Bangladeshi organization called GDRI to address various COVID uh, impacts in rural Bangladesh. And Gabrielle and Moet Shepi have already highlighted the huge negative impact of COVID on education worldwide and the importance of addressing learning inequality during the pandemic. But apart from COVID, educational disruptions in low and middle income countries are very common. Right, so where, where education of millions of children are affected on a yearly basis due to natural disasters, for example, school, school closures due to uh, severe flooding, uh, uh, war, uh, political unrest like hartals in India or Bangladesh, or even teacher absenteeism. And most primary school children in rural areas are several years behind. And this pre existing problem has been further worsened due to school closures during the pandemic. And there is also a huge heterogeneity in access to learning. That means some children has access to remote learning, whereas many don't, uh, especially those who live in rural areas, because in developing countries, there is a huge digital divide between rural and urban areas. And these already behind children in rural areas are now even further behind because of COVID. And if we do not address this learning heterogeneity problem, then millions of children in low and middle income countries might not, might not return to schools at all. So what we ask, uh, what we try to uh, answer in this uh, research is, can we, use, can we use this wider mobile phone coverage in rural areas in developing countries to address learning inequality? Like Moet Shepi uh, uh, showed in her graph that uh, most of the households in rural and urban areas, they have uh, mobile phones, but they don't have access to internet, right? And through these, mobile, through these basic mobile phones, if we provide weekly educational support through phone calls, can it improve learning outcomes of children? And to test this, we implement an RCT in 200 Bangladeshi villages. And this could be a potential solution uh, for, uh, to address learning disruptions caused by not only COVID, but various other shocks, like I mentioned before, such as uh, school uh, closures due to flooding or earthquake or uh, even uh, war or uh, political unrest. Now, we test this in the context of Bangladesh, where all the educational institutions are closed since uh, March uh, 17th. Very recently, uh, two weeks ago, some of the schools opened up, but all the primary schools remain closed. And in total, there are 38 million students in Bangladesh, where 50% are from pri primary and mostly from rural areas. And there is also very low internet penetration in rural areas. And we, to address this, the government started uh, broadcasting various television and radio-based learning programs, but most of the households in rural areas don't also have access to television. So all these kids, they don't have any access to alternative learning, basically. And there have been also report of mothers, uh, uh, report by mothers that they are facing difficulty in homeschooling because of lack of guidance and support. And even before the pandemic, the primary education situation in Bangladesh was not up to the mark, where school dropouts at primary level was 47%, uh, where most of the dropouts happened in rural areas. And also over 50% of children in uh, um, uh, primary school could not read and understand simple texts. And due to COVID, this is uh, estimated to increase by 20 percentage points. That means three out of four ch children would not be able to read and understand simple texts. 
And the learning adjusted years of schooling is also expected to fall from six years to 5.3 years uh, this year. So what we do in uh, 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 what we do in this study, so we provide telementoring to primary school children and their mothers through an RCT. And by telementoring, uh, I mean it's a mentor, uh, it's when a mentor guides a mentee over telephone to help grow their skills and knowledge, right? And in this case, our mentees are children and their mothers. So we use GDRI, the Bangladeshi Research Organization's directory, to randomly select roughly 840 mother child pairs. And we also hired 200 student volunteers from public universities in Bangladesh as our mentors. And then we randomly assigned these mentors, these volunteer mentors, to, these, to our mother child pairs. And these mentors provided weekly education support for three, uh, three months. And uh, through, uh, through, these, uh, through phone calls, these mentors provided uh, tuition on two core subjects where students are often uh, uh, where students often fall behind so they are not uh, they do not uh, perform that well which is mathematics and english literacy and through this 30 minutes phone call uh, the institution were given to these children and we also provided uh, various supports to mothers we also provided weekly uh, sms to mothers to motivate them to uh, engage more with their children and we also provided weekly study plans to mothers to guide them through the process. Uh, yes, uh, by tuition, I mean uh, tutoring, sorry. <clears throat> so uh, in this case, half of the uh, mother-child pairs received the telementoring treatment and half did not. And here is a uh, picture uh, from one of the sessions uh, uh, where uh, the phone is on a uh, loudspeaker and the child is basically listening to the mentor and the mother is also helping the child if she has trouble understanding anything. And later the mentor also speaks to the mother about uh, any difficulty she had uh, during the previous weeks uh, home, uh, homeschooling and so on. And uh, if she had any trouble understanding the weekly plans that was sent to her and so on. So very quickly, uh, our sample, I'll just explain our sampling. So we had uh, 6,500 uh, household information from the GDRI directory, where uh, we had one phone number from each household. And from there, we randomly selected 1,500 households where we could not contact roughly 30% of the households because of various reasons, because phones were switched off or unreachable or numbers were invalid. And among the households that could be conducted, most of the households were interested. From there, we selected 838 because the rest did not uh, 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 did not uh, uh, fall under our selection criteria because uh, we, we our intervention is targeted towards uh, children who are in grades one, two, and three, whereas many children were whereas not many some children were not enrolled in any school or some were. Uh, in uh, enrolled in grade four, for example. And from these uh, selected households, we uh, gave the telemetry to 50% of the uh, mother child pairs, and 50% did not receive anything. And here, very quickly, this is our timeline. So we did our baseline in August, and our intervention started in September, uh, which uh, ended in December. And in between January and February, we did parental surveys, uh, as well as we did uh, children's uh, assessment tests to measure their, uh, to measure their uh, learning outcomes. So we are interested in three groups of outcomes here. First is a learning outcome, outcome of children in terms of uh, their English language ability, uh, numeracy, uh, as well as two other uh, subjects which are not directly targeted because we are, we are also interested in uh, um, uh, checking if there are any spillover effects on uh, non-targeted subjects. So we also measure their, um, uh, their uh, out, uh, the outcomes in terms of their Bengali literacy and general knowledge. And uh, for parental inv involvement, we measure parents' homeschooling involvement and leisure activity involvement, for example, in terms of playing and telling stories and so on in daily minutes. 
And finally, we also measure parenting style, for example, uh, negative parenting, uh, their uh, self-reported uh, uh, skills, whether our intervention is able to improve their skills or not, or these are self-reported. And then we also measure uh, their future aspirations about their children's education. And we also measure mother's confidence level about uh, teaching, uh, like homeschooling their children. And all of these outcomes uh, were a control group standardized so that the control group has mean zero and standard deviation one. And here is a picture of uh, the survey, uh, a surveying of the mothers, where the enumerator is surveying the mother. And here is a picture of one assessor assessing the children's uh, English, maths, uh, Bengali, and general knowledge skills. These were done when the government lifted the uh, uh, social distancing uh, uh, requirements. So, uh, and we followed uh, health guidelines throughout the uh, uh, throughout the field work. Now, uh, here we show uh, the test score distribution for treatment and control group, showing there is a so these large bars are for the treatment group, and the gray is for the control, and it's showing that there is a large gain in uh, the treatment group. Uh, and we also show the percentile to percentile plot of endline test scores, where the y axis shows the percentile of treatment group and the x axis shows the percentile of control group. And what it's showing is that the 30th percentile of the treatment group distribution corresponds to the 60th percentile of the control group, which means the effect of a treatment would be equivalent to moving a child from the 30th percentile to the 60th, to the 60th percentile, basically. Five minutes. Yeah. Now, very quickly, uh, our treatment effects on raw test scores. What we see here is that the targeted subjects, we see huge improvement in uh, numeracy and literacy in the treatment group. And we also observe spillovers on general knowledge and literacy, Bengali literacy. Now, one thing to uh, notice here is that in uh, primary schools in Bangladesh, 40% is the pass mark. So in English, where students are often fall behind and they do not do great in schools, here we see on average the control students actually fail the exam, where uh, fail the test, whereas uh, uh, the treatment uh, group uh, on average uh, gets uh, 15 points more than the passing grade. Now, treatment effects in, some, in terms of standard deviation units, what we see is uh, here, this line is the control group mean. And here we have 99% uh, and 95% confidence interval. And we see that uh, there is uh, improvement in learning outcomes. Uh, um, and there is also improvement uh, in parental involvement in homeschooling their children, as well as leisure activities. So if I, uh, um, uh, if, I, uh, if I mention these effects in uh, minutes spent per day, uh, here homeschooling uh, of mothers in increased by 22 minutes per day, whereas leisure activities increased by roughly 10 to 12 minutes per day. And uh, we also see there is a, a strong uh, impact on uh, reducing negative parenting. That means parents uh, were not beating or scolding their children that often. Also some improvement in parenting abilities and their aspirations about education's future, but no strong evidence on mother's self-confidence in teaching their children. Now, I also have uh, some uh, results on uh, the direct and indirect channels of impact on learning uh, uh, outcomes of children. Uh, and uh, I'll leave it uh, for discussion later on if you have any questions, but very quickly, what we find is that uh, the involvement of mentors uh, was the main, uh, had a direct impact on children's learning outcomes, but there was also a strong impact from, uh, uh, from mothers uh, in involvement in homeschooling. And we also look at heterogeneous treatment effects. Uh, and once again, I'll leave it for discussions later on. Um, uh, so uh, I'll just quickly conclude uh, is that we have uh, uh, tested this over the phone learning support and we find that it is very effective in improving learning outcomes of children and mothers homeschooling involvement. And most importantly, uh, it did not crowd out uh, 
mother's uh, involvement in leisure activities or employment time. That means we, we check whether our intervention had any impact on mother's uh, mental health or whether it uh, had any impact on their involvement in uh, uh, income generating uh, involvement in income generating activities, and we find no such uh, evidence. And we also find that the cost per child was uh, less than twenty US dollars. So for each dollar spent, we see there is an improvement in learning outcomes of zero point zero four standard deviation. And given very given the very high mobile phone penetration in rural areas, this telementoring can be an, it can be a scalable and effective solution. And this can be utilized in, in various other non-pandemic contexts, right? So uh, in developing countries, in rural areas, uh, teachers' absenteeism is a big problem, or flooding, for example, in Bangladesh, Pakistan, is a big issue. Political unrest in India or uh, in Kenya, they are, um, uh, they affect uh, children's school attendance and so on. So this kind of uh, intervention using uh, uh, or hiring uh, volunteer mentors from public university uh, can, can be an effective solution. And now we are working with BRAC to scale it up. And we also plan to continue uh, uh, beyond the current school closures. So, so we, uh, we are thinking of uh, providing this kind of support even when the school opens later on because, um, because already uh, most of the primary schools are still closed. So there's a huge uh, gap already and we need to uh, recover uh, it very soon. So thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we can go to discussion and I, I can start answering questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Abu. Uh, and thanks also for stepping, sticking to time. So that means that we've got um, about half an hour for questions and answers. Um, and the way we're going to do this is we're going to go to each of the hubs. I'm going to ask uh, just very briefly one question as the chair. Uh, and just to ask each of the panelists one question. And after that, I'm going to go to the Abuja hub, uh, collect two questions there, the Oxford hub, um, and then finally the DC hub for two questions. And then we will also look at the online questions. Uh, but if anyone in those hubs has questions, please put up your hands and just make yourselves known to whoever the people are that are managing the mics where you are. Uh, but the question I had for um, Gabby, Motsepi and Abu is just, uh, related to this idea of a shock to the education system that COVID presented. Uh, to some extent, this could, if we're looking at this optimistically, glass half full, is, is it possible that there's a silver lining here that things might have had to get a lot worse before they could get better? Things like teaching at the right level, things like a trimmed curriculum, uh, accepting that there might be ways of using technology in productive ways, uh, do you think that this is a complete unmitigated disaster in the form of COVID, or is there any possible silver lining that we can draw from COVID? Uh, just very briefly. Uh, so, Gabby, we'll start with you and then Motsepi and Abu, and then turn to the questions. I like to think of this of COVID as being that point in, in the Olympics at which in the hundred in, in, in those those sprints, um, team sprints, when it's like time to pass the baton. And that baton moment. Um, really, and who takes it on determines really who wins the race. And, and it feels as if like some countries potentially are more prepared to, to take that button and to run. And it's going to almost, it seems as if this is going to change the rankings potentially of nations. I think with respect to educational outcomes, how we respond to this. I don't feel that as a nation, we were prepared for this. Um, yes, there was, there was work going on around early grade reading and coaching. But the impacts of these, the fix sizes of these programs were, were in absolute terms so small, and we weren't prepared for something of this nature um, with respect to blended learning, with respect to RCT. And, and so to suddenly think that somehow we are going to quickly remediate and find a way to remediate effectively without having had a foundation of programs from which we could draw from is just not something that I feel sure. is where we are at. Thanks, Gabby. Motepi? Um, thank you so much, Nick, for, for that uh, interesting thought. Let me just start by saying that, you know, prior to COVID, we were implementing primarily in schools. Um, and during the pandemic, we really now needed to, um, you know, mm -hmm. think 
carefully about the type of intervention, but also how we were going to deliver services. Uh, government was very much, you know, concentrating on radio as well as TV programs that we also even heard from young people that uh, they weren't tuning in. Uh, but when you find, you know, the use of mobile technology, uh, it also presents an opportunity to really tap into that resource uh, to ensure high access. Uh, the other second, I would say, silver lining that presented itself is that now we were able to work directly with parents. Uh, when a child knows that a, my parents is invested in learning, you know, they are motivated, they're encouraged uh, to do much better. So I think this opportunity, uh, or rather this period, presented us to now understand and work directly with parents, asking them, you know, when should we do the phone calls? When are you going to be home? Uh, and just figuring out all their schedules. So I do think mm. uh, there were some, you know, opportunities uh, that presented themselves now uh, that you know didn't necessarily exist or rather weren't realized um, before. Mm. Thanks, Mosepi. And I can totally echo that in the South African context of it sort of forced us to deal with the home yeah. uh, in a much more substantial way than previously we were only ever working with the schools. Yeah. Um, Abu, what's your what's your thought on this? Yeah, so in, in uh, Bangladesh, actually, after the uh, pandemic began, the school were like uh, closed, but the government was saying like it, it will be closed for a week or two weeks and then it will open. So it took a lot of time for us to actually uh, realize that it's, uh, it's, gonna, it's not going to open so soon. And uh, I think that was a big, uh, big mistake from uh, from our sides, from uh, the government sides, but uh, very soon we uh, realized since these most of the kids don't have any access to any alternative learning, like I showed you before, these phone uh, like phone delivered uh, tutoring uh, can be a big solution, and it's not only a solution for this. Uh, in Bangladesh, when there is heavy rain, when there is flooding, schools are closed or uh, political unrest are very common. And uh, no one actually thought about any solutions to, uh, to, uh, to support children during those times as well. So what this pandemic actually let us learn is that, okay, now this low-tech, low uh, like Mochep is a uh, term, this low-tech solution, uh, this low-tech te no, low technology is a good solution for not only this pandemic, but also for uh, any future obstacles uh, that uh, uh, students might face. Might, might mm. face. So, uh, yeah. The, Thanks, Abu. Thank and I see there's also some comments uh, in the Q&A as well as the chat. I see the comment by Felipe saying they've had a similar intervention um, in Colombia and the effects were small. And these are very large effect sizes. I think there was another comment about the effect sizes in the Bangladesh uh, intervention. Um, but I think let's turn to the, the different uh, in-person gatherings. So the first one is if we can get two questions from the Abuja um, hub. And we'll take both of them together. So if you can just write it down, if it's addressed to you, and if you can just tell us who you're addressing your question to of the speakers. Okay, thank you. My question is for Mutsafi and Abubakar. So um, I didn't guess from your study, um, does this intervention, does it mitigate or moderate the effect? I mean, was there still learning losses? Because I mean, in developing countries with better technology, um, um, and interventions, we still, I mean, the report and overwhelming evidence still point to learning loss with COVID-19. So do you think um, this intervention, were they able to mitigate or moderate it? And um, in addition to that, uh, you talked about the role of this technology in at home. What role do you think they can play in school? Can we bring them to school? And what role do you think they can play in school? Thank you. Great, thanks. Is there a second question in the Abuja Hub? If not... Um, My question is for oh, Gabriel. Great. Um, looking at South Africa, she said that the recovery period they're looking at is about three years. How do you plan to achieve this? What methods do you want to put in place? And um, don't you think three years is too much? Because whatever um, results you come with, I know will help 
in every other place because the COVID learning loss applies to virtually every place on this planet. So um, whatever you come up with can also be applicable to us on ground here. So my question okay. is, what are the methods and don't you think the three year period is too long? Thank you. Sure. Thanks so much. So I think let's take those two questions. Um, Motepi and Abu, do you want to start with that first question? And then Gabby, the second question about how long you think it will take to remediate these uh, losses in South Africa. Motepi? Thanks, but, um, so we believe, um, or rather from the results, um, when we look at the, you know, mitigating on the learning loss, uh, the phone and the SMS um, intervention certainly, you know, played uh, much more uh, of a role. Um, in total, there was, you know, a 31% reduction in, in numeracy. Uh, so that means that, you know, that ability of students who are not able, you know, to subtract, multiply or divide. Uh, so it definitely, you know, played more on, on that role. Um, and also just translating it to your second question about uh, how can this be applicable in school setting um, is currently right now, you know, the government doesn't provide mobile phones uh, to parents uh, and students. But in the event that, you know, large, uh, you know, ICT budgets could be channeled uh, to provide uh, those resources so that, you know, teachers uh, could be able to target, you know, delivery or rather attention to the lower performing students uh, instead of, you know, the whole classroom. Uh, that could be one way this could play out uh, in, in more of a school setting. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that is that these kind of interventions can, can never, uh, like, um, uh, uh, overcome the inequality that was caused by COVID, right? So no one can replace this in-person uh, learning in classrooms um, uh, because uh, it's not only uh, learning face-to-face, -face, it's also interactions with uh, their friends uh, and so on. Um, and everything together uh, is very important for um, uh, skill development of children. So this, this kind of telephone-based intervention, what, what it's showing that, of course, when there is no option to, um, to help out these kids uh, in needs, this could be a very cost-effective uh, uh, option but it's not enough to overcome all the all the inequalities that was caused yeah thanks Thank and you. gabby in your response here i think it'll be great if you can weave in the response to asia's question that she asked in the comment about some of the gendered effects but i think it's actually a bigger question also about the you could think about it as a matthew effect of the rich getting richer or the people that were benefiting the most being hurt the hardest uh, in the long run, how long do you think it's going to take uh, to, to remediate these losses, if that's even the word we should be using? Um, and the second one is, given our context in South Africa, is how do you think it will impact uh, inequality? Gabby? Well, um, so I think I want to draw on this in, in modeling learning losses and longer term learning losses. Um, Martin Gustafson and um, uh, Carol Nugadili were in their paper. They found that with, with shorter COVID, uh, COVID uh, periods, so COVID uh, closures, um, and with no remediation, that this would continue to impact on children's, uh, in, on school leaving outcomes, so our matriculation outcomes in grade 12 for the next 11 years, um, without, without any level of um, intervention involved. And so there is no doubt that a, you know, a three-year plan is certainly not going to be sufficient because these children are going to be at various points along the line going to need a, a additional support and engagement. Um, so, so I think the, the department is certainly going to have to think about beyond this revised annual teaching plan of three years. They're going to have to think way beyond, beyond that. Um, in terms of inequality and what this would do for the nation. So what I've showed you, the results were pertaining to, to schools in under-resourced contexts. In South Africa, we have probably one of the most, we have the most unequal country in, in, with respect to income inequality and our learning inequality is extremely high when we take into account children who are in fee-paying fee fee schools as, as well. We don't have any evidence yet to see to what extent those that are in fee-paying schools have moved ahead of children that are in under-resourced contexts. 
we would expect that this is very much likely to be the case because in, in wealthier context schools in South Africa, which is about 15 to 20 percent of the population, class sizes are much smaller. And as a result, they haven't had to apply this rotational scheduling when schools returned. So the number of days that wealthier children have had of schooling is considerably more um, as a result of, during the COVID pandemic and into 2021 relative to poorer children. And I think this, this remediation is one aspect of it. And yes, we have to do this. And how are we going to do this? I'm not so sure, but there needs to be experimentation um, along the lines of what we've seen in these other countries and these wonderful examples. Um, but in addition to that, we have a, a, a classroom size uh, crisis, really, to some extent. So if, the, if the, the nation continues to say you have to have one meter social distancing between children, and we have class sizes of over 60 to 100 in many, in many cases, then this rotational scheduling will inevitably still apply. And so this is something that has to be dealt with as well before we even think about remediation, just get children to school every single day. Mm. So we, we have I've... this crisis right now of, of just simply children are not attending every day, even, even if you know, legislation does allow. Mm. I think that's a great point, Gabby, that even when we do remove that one meter social distance uh, requirement, which is the case in South Africa, uh, in our randomized control trial in Limpopo this week, we're collecting data and 40% of teachers are still saying that rotational timetables are still being practiced today. Um, so I think it, it, the legislation is one thing, the practice is another. So let's turn to the, the Oxford hub, uh, stay on the same time frame uh, and see if there are any questions there. Are there. Let's collect two questions there. If not, we'll move to the DC hub. Anyone at the Oxford hub have any questions there? Thank you. Uh, my question is to Gabi. Uh, thanks for that very uh, interesting presentation. Um, at the Reed Center, uh, we've been doing some research in, in Ethiopia to understand uh, learning loss due to COVID-19 school closures uh, as part of the RISE Ethiopia project. And uh, we published a couple of blogs, including the one uh, you cited earlier in your presentation. So uh, similar to your overall finding, we, we found that progress in numeracy slowed following school closures, but, but um, numeracy learning level improved more for children attending pre-primary education in, in urban areas. But in your study, Gabi, you found that students with um, stronger initial reading proficiency were more negatively impacted. So I, I, I was wondering if you could uh, reflect on why, why, why that is the case. And probably um, a follow-up to the question from Abu Jahab. How, how ready do you think are teachers in South Africa to implement those uh, interventions uh, by the Department of Basic Education in relation to the recovery uh, annual teaching plans? It seems that we have uh, some problem of teachers' readiness in Ethiopia. So I was wondering if you could also reflect on that. Thank you. Thanks. Let's take the second question and we can answer both together. Yeah, go for it. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, this is a question for Abu. So your impacts are quite large uh, and you didn't have time to go through the uh, mediation analysis, but I guess it has to do with the kind of monitoring and, and the personal attention, both for the kids and the parents. So can you say a little bit more like what was the duration, what time and how frequent uh, do you talk to the kids and the parent? Because that seems, I mean, from the first impressions, it's not incredibly expensive for, for such a personalized approach. But um, yeah, if you can get a feel for that, that would be great. Thanks. Okay, great. Maybe Abu, we start with you and then we'll go to Gabby. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, we actually we actually don't have, uh, because we didn't have a specific guideline that in, invest uh, 20 minutes out of 30 minutes, invest 20 minutes with children and 10 minutes on parents. It was not like that. It was more about uh, their uh, demand. So if the child uh, had lots of trouble understanding some uh, maths or something in English, which the mother couldn't help during the last week, the uh, mentor was uh, helping out that kid. And if uh, uh, that takes like 25 minutes to explain, then that was it. And then five minutes was invested on uh, mothers, for example. But mothers, on top of these one-to-one uh, -one conversation, mothers also received these uh, text messages uh, 
uh, as well as various study plans, right? So uh, to answer your question, it was not like 50% uh, time to kids, 50% time to mother. It was more about, more about uh, who needs more uh, attention or who, uh, who has uh, more trouble now. Or, uh, yeah, so uh, that was it. And uh, uh, about mediation, I'll just briefly say that we, we look at the, all these parental channels. So in terms of homeschooling in, involvement, in terms of uh, uh, leisure activity involvement, in terms of negative parenting and so on, and how much that translates to improvement in uh, children's uh, education. And we find that uh, it's mostly the uh, direct engagement where also there's also uh, like uh, I think 14 or 15 percent of the effect is explained by uh, parental channels like mothers more involvement in homeschooling and so on um, uh, yeah and it's huge the effect is huge uh, Nick can I continue for two more minutes please sure yeah, the effect is really large, uh, and it also answers uh, to some questions. I'll answer to Andy Smart's question later on. Sorry, I am new to this, so I say like it's answered. Um, so uh, the effect is large is for various reasons. One is that these children have no access to alter alternative learning, not even private tutoring. And uh, most of them don't have television at home. So they don't have access to these kind of television uh, programs that the government uh, is broadcasting right now. So the counterfactual is basically there is nothing. And when you have this small support, they are very eager um, to learn, for example. And then these uh, tutors, these mentors are from public universities, which are very prestigious in Bangladesh and especially in rural areas. Uh, people actually value opinions and advice from uh, public university students. So when you have someone calling from uh, Dhaka University, for example, to help your child, the, the mother pays more attention. And uh, also, for example, when explaining a math, small math problem in, uh, in Bangladeshi rural villages, especially, uh, teachers mo are mostly absent. And even if there are, they tell the kid to come for private tutoring and they don't teach much at, at school. So students actually, these children actually don't learn a proper way of, for example, uh, mathematical way or mm. uh, proper translation of English. So sure. when these, uh, these students from private uh, public universities, they, uh, they are, uh, I think they are very highly motivated. They have previous uh, tutoring experience. So um, their way of explaining things, I think was much better than uh, uh, what uh, the children would get. Sure. In normal. Sorry, I took lots of time. Uh, no, no, that's you. fine. Thanks, Abu. And I think there's actually a similar question for Miguel, from Miguel in the chat for Motsepi around the process evaluation, sort of what other information do we know, not only the outcomes, a uh, similar question to Barbara is also asking to Motsepi around the workbooks and books where there non-phone interventions uh, that were targeted at these. And I'm going to ask Motsepi and Abu to just answer those in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, Gabby, do you want to answer that question that was asked to you earlier? All right. So this question of uh, people are raising around seeing large and negative impacts for stronger children and, and with initial strong, strong initial reading ability. And that also includes um, girls in South African schools. We're seeing this in our data set and on these on the specific skill of, of reading and text reading. It might be it might be different for numeracy, it might be different for, for other aspects, it could be different for comprehension and so forth. Unfortunately, our, we didn't have um, uh, outcome measures beyond um, the, these measures that we could use. Um, and so it really, I think it's it's up for some empirical um, uh, uh, you know, evidence really to, to consider and to see in what other skills do we still see this pattern um, emerging. Um, unfortunately, we don't have anything on that we could really look at the mechanisms um, for why you would see these different things happening in terms of other, other variables such as um, what children are completing in class, what's in their textbooks. We don't have much enough evidence to really unpick what the mechanism is. But really, the position we kind of take is these, these children were doing better in school and they were on a better reading trajectory initially. And so they really were standing to lose 
um, they were for them schooling was an effective um, an effective process and so they stand to lose potentially more um, than those for whom schooling wasn't really benefiting them as much and that, that would oh. be the main point and whether teachers can implement these new plans yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure whether I can say that, 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 that they are prepared to do that. Um, evidence from the ground is that it's been a very confusing time for teachers. You've got classes coming in, one group comes in one day, one another comes in another day, and just keeping track of where children are. Sure. Before you even thought about um, revised curriculum is in itself a challenge. Yeah. Thanks, Gabby. So I think let's now turn to the last, uh, get one or two questions if they're very brief from the DC um, hub. Uh, so if you can just, if there are any questions, just put up your hand and let the person who's there know. Um, otherwise, we'll turn to the online questions. Are there any questions from DC? Uh, no, it doesn't seem like we have any questions here in DC. Okay, cool. So. Thanks, Marla. So then I think maybe we can turn to Barbara's question um, and Motsepi and Abu, if you guys want to answer that live, uh, I think it, it's getting both to the physical components of an intervention. Uh, so uh, you'll see there she's asking about books and workbooks in the home, also whether or not there was data that was collected on other forms of an intervention or any use of educational radio or TV. Um, it, that the phone intervention could be complementing and could that explain part of the impact. Uh, so Motepe and Abu, do you want to weigh in on those sort of non-phone based elements of the intervention or possible other factors? Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, let me start us off. So our intervention primarily focused on delivering content via a mobile phone. We didn't provide any workbooks or notebooks. Uh, when we did ask, you know, uh, teachers, particularly in various schools, uh, they did provide homework. Uh, to students, but again, this was inconsistent depending on which school uh, the students, you know, went into. Uh, the other element that I think, um, you know, very much that government did try uh, that we didn't uh, collect data on is that there were uh, TV as well as uh, radio programs uh, that provided educational content. Uh, however, we didn't, you know, measure measure whether uh, students were able to access uh, those services, but just more uh, qualitative, uh, even qualitative responses, even looking at the times in which the shows were aired. Uh, it was often a time sometimes late uh, in the day, but also, you know, the engagement level uh, seems pretty low for from the students. Uh, the other thing that I think uh, we do know uh, from from this is that one is you know parents uh, particularly you know were, were much more at home uh, during the lockdown period. Uh, so this allowed an opportunity for us to be able to intervene uh, earlier on when parents were, were home, uh, but also supporting you know, their, their students and their children, uh, particularly during the times in which there was the lockdown area. Uh, when parents returned back to, to work, uh, we now have to or had to figure out uh, ways in which we can still you know, do the phone call uh, you know, late in the evenings or even just during weekends. Uh, but I think the big thing to emphasize is that parent uh, engagement directly with their child uh, certainly played a role in which, uh, you know, the child was very much motivated uh, and interested in learning. Mm. Thanks, Amotepi. And then Abu, if you can just give a one minute response there. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, these children had uh, books and workbooks. I think that's the question, right? Yeah, uh, they had these books uh, at home, but there was no proper guidance, especially in uh, uh, mathematics and English, where um, uh, where uh, even mothers uh, lack uh, uh, much uh, knowledge. So what we, uh, so one component, uh, uh, in our intervention was we provided various solution manu manuals to uh, mothers as well. So, for example, uh, we know that in grade one, this is the mathematics book and we gave uh, solutions to various problems in that book. So to help the mothers, uh, but also I think uh, these guidance from these students were very valuable uh, because um, 
even um, because in, in Bangladesh, especially in rural context, people are not that great in English or uh, mathematics, but mm. they can easily uh, handle, uh, for example, teaching in Bengali, which is their mother tongue, or uh, general knowledge, which is also in uh, Bengali, for example. And sure. uh, another uh, on uh, collecting data on educational radio and TV, uh, we don't collect it, but we, uh, in our paper, we actually cite a study which uh, did a survey in rural Bangladesh, which showed that um, um, like uh, most of the households don't have TV. And uh, those households with TV, their parents say that uh, children don't uh, actually sure. watch these programs on TV. So cool. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Abu. Um, so just to wrap up in the last minute, just to make sure that we close on time, um, I think that these are three great presentations. Uh, the first one setting the scene and giving us a, a, an indication of the extent of the learning losses that we're talking about. And then the second two, that it is actually possible to do something to remediate some of the losses that we're seeing. Although I, I think both Motepi and Abu would say quite emphatically that this is not making up for everything that was lost and certainly not for all children. And that this is just trying to do the little that we can to make the losses not as large as they would otherwise be. And I think maybe that's the, the last point that I'd like to make just as the chair here is that it's probably the wrong thing to think about this conceptually as how do we catch up the learning that was lost in COVID. The learning losses are ongoing. The hemorrhaging is continuing. The bleeding in the education system continues. Uh, and I think that the, that's the main point to take away here is that at least in developing countries from the ones that we've heard from today, uh, that that is a, a critical point is making sure that getting back to all children back to school, all teachers back to school and learning uh, happening full time is probably the number one priority of all education systems. And no technology or non-technology based, home-based intervention is going to counteract for the learning that happens at school, even if that learning is extremely low. Um, and much lower than what we want. Uh, so Claire, I think I'll leave it there and hand it back over to you. Thanks to all of the three presenters. We are gonna break now for 15 minutes and start promptly again at 2.30, 9.30. Um, and our next session is on instructional coherence and Peter Sneels will be chairing. Thanks.